Welcome to Mom and Mind, a podcast about maternal mental health discussing conception, pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Real stories from moms and family members who have made it from struggling to wellness and interviews with experts and advocates who work for moms and families to get the help they need. This podcast is meant to offer information and awareness and is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Welcome to Mom and Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. In honor of International Father's Mental Health Day, June 22nd, 2020, we are re-releasing this episode on fathers and perinatal mental health with our guest on episode 81, Dr. Sheehan Fisher. There is a big movement to focus on and support fathers' mental health in the transition into fatherhood, and we need to be focusing on this more and more. We've had a couple of other episodes on Mom and Mine that you can check out with a focus on dads. Episode 17, Dads Need Postpartum Support Too, with Dr. Danny Singley. And episode 23, He's Not Talking About It, A Father's Journey with Mark Williams. In this episode, we have the honor of hearing from Dr. Sheehan Fisher about new fathers, the transitions they may go through when a baby comes along, and the challenges and strengths that they may experience as well. There are quite a few gems in our talk today, one of which is how the role of fatherhood is changing and adapting to the times, and thoughts about navigating that. Dr. Fisher's take on these transitions is not to be missed. I'm sure you'll want to share this with the fathers and men in your life. Dr. Sheehan Fisher is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine with an appointment at Lurie Children's Hospital. His research and clinical interests focus on perinatal mental health with a subspecialty in father's mental health and role in the family. His aim is to understand the mechanisms that place mothers and fathers at risk for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and the effect of both parents' mental health on infant outcomes. He is also passionate about increasing father's competence in the home and reconstructing views of masculinity. Let's hear from Dr. Fisher. Welcome, Dr. Fisher. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm very excited to talk with you. I feel like you know so many things about so many things, uh, and one of your specialties is um, helping and supporting fathers and father's mental health. So we're going to get into that today. That sounds Uh, great. Yeah. Um, Can you tell us a a little bit about your work? I know you do quite a bit of things, but about your current work? Um, So my work, as you stated, focuses on fathers, and my goal is to include fathers within perinatal mental health. So I have different research projects I've been working on over the years. Um, One I'm actually wrapping up looking at changes in fathers' hormones to understand how that potentially can have an association with fathers' mental health and depression. But in general, my goal is to look at both mothers and fathers in the home Mm -hmm. to understand how their mental health has an impact on each other and then has an impact on infant health outcomes long term. Oh, my gosh. That is that's absolutely what's needed. I feel like there's, you know, not enough of looking at the whole system together. There's Mm -hmm. so much there's been so much focus on mothers and and kind of one side of the system. It seems like it's absolutely time for you to be doing the work that you're doing. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, that's what one of my focus was just to get a view of the whole picture since fathers mm-hmm. are way more involved in the home now and mm-hmm. we are learning that they do matter for the impact on the child. So we need to understand how so. Right. Um, so if you can kind of give like a, at least to start with a snapshot of, of things that you've seen for fathers um, and their experience, um, either prenatally or postpartum specifically. Well, I think that fathers, especially new fathers, they are trying to adjust to a role that they don't feel feel fully prepared for. Mm-hmm. And especially if you look historically, fathers, you know, and you know, maybe the past few decades were not as involved, so they don't always have a blueprint of what it looks like to be an engaged parent. And I always talk about how competency is very important for people. So if they don't mm-hmm. feel competent, they're less likely to get involved. So I think that especially during the prenatal period, fathers are searching and looking for, you know, how do I make sure I'm prepared for this role? They, I've heard so many fathers say they want to be a better father than even the examples they've had. Mm. They don't really know what to do. And that can be quite difficult without having the tools to be able to adjust to that period. And of course, that in turn can start to create stress for the fathers. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And then especially once they do have a child, then it's a really, you know, the Everything starts to change so quickly. They're trying to figure out where is their place within the home and also trying to make sure they can support the mom through her adjustment, whether it's stress in general or she's dealing with depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it could be quite foreign for them to figure out how to adjust to all these different changing roles 
and situations within the life of childcare, supporting the partner, and also maintaining the home and work and whatnot. It's a lot to juggle for them. Right. And, and as you said before, their fathers are more involved than they ever used to be. Um, and I, I love how you stated that. They're just kind of trying to, there, there's no um, precedent necessarily for how to do all of this uh, yeah. in a way that they want to. Exactly. I mean, when I teach or present about this, I try to also give a background that actually historically fathers were way more engaged in the very beginning of American history. Mm. But over the time, this has started to change as the industrial age and other things occurred with fathers working outside the home. Mm -hmm. There's been a shift in this adjustment. And really, when you watch the trajectory of father involvement, it's really been focused on economics. So when fathers work on the farm, they're very very much engaged in the family and involved with parenting. But then when they work outside the home, they became disengaged. And then our cultural norms started to change of what was the expectation of fathers and men in general. Mm -hmm. But now that most families can't survive off of just one income, we're starting to make that shift back. And the economics are really driving this force. But for these current fathers, they don't have a recent blueprint, as I said, to even know how to adjust. Oh, well, I really love that perspective and the, the historical perspective, so to speak, that, um, that you know, that timeline that you just spoke of, really how the culture has shifted and changes, changed over time, yeah. um, it really, really gives a great look at how and why things are the way they are right now. Yeah. It's, we so often forget the context of why things are challenging. Yeah. I think that's important too, especially because I still hear the rhetoric that, you know, men are innately in, you know, unable to be engaged fathers or mm. whether men are saying that or even on the other side. But I think that this creates a misconception that's almost biological rather than simply cultural environmental factors and, like I said, economic factors that actually play into fathers' engagement and therefore we can make a change. Um, everybody needs to hear what you just said. Like everybody, everybody, whoever's listening right now, share this with everybody. <laughs> I mean, it, this is essential. It's so yeah. important yeah. Um, that, right. I mean, it's and uh, the way you were stating it before that, you know, there's something innately wrong with fathers. Gosh, that, that must be really insulting yeah. um, on I some think, level. It is. And I think that's something that does discourage. I mean, I think in general, we need to encourage fathers and support that aspect, but there are many fathers who want to be engaged, but when they are viewed as a secondary parent mm -hmm. from prenatal all the way through, it really does kind of set a tone that they're not supposed to either be engaged or they're not encouraged or even at times discouraged from their involvement. I think that it's something mm -hmm. I talk about too, where fathers sometimes, especially in the very beginning phase, if they are trying to change the diaper or dress the child, do certain things, if they're told they're doing it wrong or there's only one way, mm -hmm. Builds an, an idea that they're only a secondary parent, therefore they start to form into this role. And we have to figure out how do we make this balance across the board so that the fathers have their space to get engaged and, of course, encouraging it. Mm -hmm. There is still room for that for fathers who don't know or are not as inclined, but we need to kind of meet everyone halfway to make this a more equal system. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm all for that. I, I really hope everyone can hear what you said. That is so important. And, and then if, I mean, that's just, these are not just, I mean, these are major life changes, role changes. And then mm -hmm. there's this whole other layer of depression, anxiety, anger, or whatever might be going on for a dad um, perinatally or postpartum specifically. What mm -hmm. have you seen, or can you speak to that in terms of like mood changes that, that fathers go through? Yeah, so I think this is something that is, you know, I was just more research more recently showing that fathers do have adjustments in their mood during this time. And so we typically within this field look at perinatal depression as the main focus, which fathers do experience with an increased rate of sadness, and anecdotia, or lack of pleasure in things, um, feeling stressed, fatigued, and dealing with this role transition and that adjustment. But I think that because we are focused on um, perinatal health and especially for depression, we lose sight that fathers may experience things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Especially since in our culture, especially around masculinity, men are not as inclined to cry or to say that they're feeling sad or other types of emotional symptoms. So we might be missing out on other types of behaviors that would fit into something called masculine depression, where they might be in more engaged in more um, aggressive type behaviors, or they might even sometimes drug use 
or even other types of um, externalizing behaviors that will show that they're going through a high level of distress, but may not express in the same um, traditional form of per perinatal depression. So what, what might a father himself be experiencing? Like, how would he know that this is what's going on for him? Well, he might start to notice that there might become more short, irritable type of behaviors mm -hmm. and ability to feel that they can focus or even sometimes thinking that they are not um, accomplishing enough or feel like defeated. Mm -hmm. These types of symptoms that might be more geared toward mastery type of activities like work or um, accomplishing something, mm -hmm. but still show that they're not feeling that they're able to perform a function the same way that they used to. And a lot of times this can be played in from the stress levels and also from just the fact that they are sleep deprived or other factors going on. Mm -hmm. But the concern is if it's really having a significant impact on their functioning or it's becoming more chronic of a change, then it's more concerning. Okay. Um, this, I, I guess what that makes me think about is, you know, if, if dad is, is experiencing things and thinking about this and saying like, okay, yeah, I do feel these things, would he necessarily be expressing that? Well, you know, I guess it depends on the person, but, but what might somebody else see? What would a, a wife see or a partner see um, uh, from the outside, I guess? Well, yeah, I think that's two points to make. Like for one, especially if the mother's dealing with depression, you see sometimes either partner, when you see that one, this other one in distress, they become focused on taking care of the other person. So you might not see anything much because they're really focused on keeping the family afloat. Mm -hmm. But then once the other person heals, a lot of times you start to actually see the symptoms start to spill out. And for the, the partner, it's really, they have a lot of times the best insight into the person's behavior because they're used to a certain consistent a pr um, presentation uh -huh. to change, especially if it seems pathological or seems that the person is engaging in more extreme behaviors than usual, then that will be a sign for them that they might want to at least talk to someone just to make sure someone who is a professional can assess what's going on with them because they may not be able to make the diagnosis, so to speak, but mm -hmm. they will be able to see that there is a change in their partner who, whom they're used to seeing in a certain way. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I'm thinking for the, the moms who are listening and who might be concerned um, about their partner. How can you talk to your partner about this without um, making them feel bad? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that we, it's always helpful to talk about things contextually. Mm -hmm. You're saying that there's a lot going on. That you can see there's a lot of stress. And mm -hmm. Using stress rather than necessarily mental health a lot of times is an easier pill to swallow for most people. Yeah. Because I think people can understand that perspective that, yeah, I am dealing with a lot of stress or I am tired, mm -hmm. I am probably worn out or neglected, and therefore it doesn't hurt to at least talk through some of those things and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Not always an easy topic to bring up, but hopefully there could be a, at least a conversation about the experience of adjusting to becoming new parents. Sure. Uh, sometimes what I hear, um, if I'm meeting with a mom and she has suspicion that something's going on with her husband or based on what she said, I think maybe something is going on. Um, th what I get as, in terms of feedback uh, is that if they do bring it up with their partner, um, that there's some pushback, like, I, well, I don't need help. Um, I don't need anyone to tell me how to raise my child. So, so those kinds mm -hmm. of, not all the time. Sometimes I also yeah. hear like, yeah, I'm really struggling a lot and maybe I should go get help. Um, but for the people who kind of um, are having a hard time recognizing or mm, I guess admitting on some level that they might need help, yeah. what's a good way to support them to make a step? Well, I think, I know for one, when I do treat moms or dads, eventually I always bring in a partner just in general, just to kind of get, you know, collateral information mm -hmm. and also to um, have this person to be a support system. Mm -hmm. so I think this is a good segue too, because many times this other individual has never been in treatment before or ever been in a, a, a environment with a, a therapist. Mm -hmm. so I think that sometimes bringing them in so they can kind of dispel some of these myths about what they expect and it's honestly almost funny how many times they've commented that they are expecting something completely different based on what they right. seem to be. Oh, right. And especially since I focus a lot on behavioral therapies, I think that a lot of times men are responsive to that because it's more concrete, mm -hmm. it's more about skills and training. So it makes it a little bit more, it fits a little bit more with their model of something that they might feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But then getting close to that and seeing that it can be a safe place, but it's not going to be meaning their, um, their previous assumptions 
that really does help them to even think about the idea that this may not be a bad place to talk about some of the things that they're, that they're going through directly. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I, so right. Helping them kind of get one foot in the door if somebody else yeah. is already in therapy mm-hmm. is awesome. Um, yeah. Because, right, you're, I mean, you're speaking on some level to the, the stigma and specifically yeah. for men getting support in um, therapy. Yeah. Um, what have you seen around, around stigma and, and what might make someone take pause in getting that kind of support in therapy? Well, I think honestly, across the board, I think is, I think across the board for mothers and fathers is a similar issue, which is being considered as weak. It just might mm-hmm. look different based on gender, but I think both mothers and fathers both struggle with that because there's a certain cultural expectation for moms for being strong mm-hmm. and same thing for fathers in their own form. And anything that would admit that you're not strong enough becomes mm-hmm. a problem. Then on the other side, because people consider mental health almost as if you if you try hard enough or if you you know must up enough strength you'll be able to get through it. People mm-hmm. feel they have to do it on their own and a lot of times wait until it's too late. And this is kind of the, one of the biggest stigmas that I think becomes problematic because I think across the board in America, but also even certain cultures, there's these different types of um, presumptions that that being in a mental health setting means that you're not strong enough or that you are not having enough faith or different types of views that really gets in the way of just genuine good medical care. Right. Um, and and that, that's a lot uh, to kind of bump up against if you're considering getting help for yourself. Uh, you yeah. have to push past all of those ideas about what it means to get support and, and try and cope with stress in a different way. Yeah. And I've been focused on also trying to write op-eds and do other types of media because I think that the biggest way to change that is not even so much about the research but mm-hmm. also change the culture views is getting into the media because this is where a lot of these views are perpetuated. Right. Is that they're reading things or seeing TV or seeing other um, outlets that are kind of putting mental health in a certain light. And the more we can reach the general public to help them understand it in a, a approachable way, I think it helps toward decreasing some of the stigma. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and two, it sounds like you're doing that with specifically with for fathers, new fathers, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and trying to change the idea of what fatherhood can look like. Yes, absolutely. How do you feel like fathers are receiving these ideas of, of a change in masculinity and, and being more involved and taking care of their mental health? Well, I think that on the individual side, they are very receptive. I think that when I meet them individually, they feel relief that they can actually be honest because when it comes down to, and I say it's a lot in my therapies, that reality is always reality. So mm-hmm. even with these ideas of masculinity from like those old, like, you know, cowboy movies or whatever, men still felt emotions, but they drank, they did other things to try to cover it up. So Mm-hmm. The reality is fathers internally and men internally know they're going through distress. They know that they're suffering. They know they're trying to push through a lot of things. So when they actually have an outlet where it's actually safe or it's appropriate for them to see that it's not taking away from their masculinity to actually experience this, it just kind of lets it bring to the light what they're going through, but it's not like they're not aware of it already. So I think oh, it right. provides a human relief for them to be able to admit what they're struggling with. Mm-hmm. And then especially when we focus on competency or learning how to develop skills to deal with mental health, on both sides, it makes them feel empowered mm-hmm. to go into the situation and feel like they know what to do, mm-hmm. whether that's how to take care of a home or to take care of the child, whether it's how to take care of their partner, or even how to deal with stress in a more productive way. When they see that they can make behavioral changes and it has a positive outcome, it makes them feel that they, they have a good, genuine contribution to the home and have a place within the home. So I think that they, in general, they find it as a positive experience. Yeah, I mean, that that's really powerful. Um, I, I my, some of, some of my frustration with, um, I, I guess, just like maybe it's mostly the stigma is there's such there can be such relief and such impactful change when people can get the help they need, even if it's not a psychotherapy, if, if it's mm-hmm. just some other type of support. Um, yeah. But it's getting past that point of either the thought of like, I don't, it's too much for me to go get this help or I shouldn't, or like you were saying before, I should be able to just do this with enough strength yeah. um, and, and kind of fighting that feeling that they could use some support 
um, it's just, it, it can be so good on the other side when you get what you need. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that when they see tangible outcomes, like seeing that the child's health can improve, mm-hmm. or seeing that they can function even better at their job, or they can manage the stress better, or their marriage is better, like these tangible things makes it worthwhile or seems like there's a purpose behind it rather than simply feeling that they're just going to somewhere to complain. So mm-hmm. it really does mm-hmm. help to change their perspective. What other kinds of um, coping suggestions or things that you found to be helpful that, you know, outside of, of psychotherapy? Um, well, I think that people have to, I mean, I think that people being in touch with their value system really does help. Mm-hmm. Because when they have a new child, they know they don't have the same amount of time to do everything they used to do. Right. They have to figure out how they prioritize. And many times people just kind of do all or nothing. If they can't do everything, they just shut down, just kind of go to work, take care of my, my family, and that's mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Rather than figuring out, you know, based on my values, maybe even if I only get 15 minutes of a little workout in, or even if I could only hang out with my friend for a half hour, knowing that it has the biggest impact, like the biggest bang for the buck, helps them to adjust their life to this new situation, but still keep some of the key components that makes them them. So I think that just in general, having that approach does help people to adjust through that period, but mm-hmm. then also learning some skills, let's say it's mindfulness, and that could be in different forms. Sometimes people use yoga or just mindfulness training mm-hmm. or listening to music. Like it's just really learning how do you shut off your mind and not let that stress kind of spill over or reduce that rumination. Mm-hmm. It really does help people to use this type of skill to reduce their general stress. Can you speak a little bit to the rumination for fathers? What have you seen? One of the things I, I've helped out with some classes around father classes, and it's interesting to hear about what fathers are most worried about going into becoming a father. Mm-hmm. And one of them is feeling, one, that they're not going to be able to financially take care of their family or that something goes wrong. So even though they have like a solid job, they're, they're at a heightened worry about losing their job or messing up to the point that it can create a lot of stress because they just keep thinking about it and ruminating, mm. even when it's presenting as an issue. Hmm. So I think that fathers feel a certain level of pressure in that respect. But then on the other side, feeling like they can't do enough is yeah. also another thing that can come up where they feel like, you know, they don't know what to do to best support their family or how to, you know, what their place is within the home. So this can cause a certain level of rumination for them feeling like they are never going to be enough for their family. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's such a bummer. I mean, I can, I can imagine shutting down mm-hmm. uh, uh, from feeling that. I mean, you know, yeah. moms feel that too, um, maybe in a different yeah. way, depending. Um, gosh. Um, so it makes me think of how important communication is then um, yeah. too between partners. Yeah, and that's something that usually starts to break down mm-hmm. as soon as they deliver because obviously there's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. Something that when I meet with individuals, I bring in a partner, that's one of the conversations we have, or when I do couples therapy, is about how do you make sure to have time to talk that's not just about diapers or tasks or things that has to be done the next day, mm-hmm. but also keeping the communication between the two of you, whether it's about resolving issues between them or even just simply the things you used to talk about prior to having a child, keeping mm-hmm. some little normalcy within the relationship is key. Otherwise, people start to feel like they're starting to feel distant, and mm-hmm. that can start to spread and kind of um, increase exponentially over time if it starts off in the very beginning of their having a, a newborn. Oh, right, and and you were saying a little bit before um, about you know kind of feeling left out. You know, so much focus goes to um, the mom and the baby, um, and certainly then you know communication is potentially breaking down too. Mm-hmm. Um, so I imagine fathers feeling more and more kind of just out of the loop, um, yeah, less connected. They, they do feel out of loop and less connected, but I think that can partially be resolved by them having more of an engaged role. Mm-hmm. I think that they feel left out because they feel like the, the mother's maybe mo- more focused on the child. Mm-hmm. And they, feel they don't have their own part, but if they feel like it's a teamwork, that helps to kind of reduce some of this isolation because it becomes a, a group effort toward the parental team supporting the child and supporting each other rather than simply the father being more of an um, a, a isolated member within the family. So I think that there's something that could be, I think the fathers could think of it that way. It can mm-hmm. help increase their involvement, but also reduce some of this feeling of being isolated. 
Mm -hmm. So that might, taking kind of an active role uh, in terms of figuring out how they want to be a parent, um, how they want to engage. Yeah, like whether it's from like a lot of times, whether it's breastfeeding, where they really have no part, but they can find ways that they can actually support the mom during that time. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, just general child care in general that they can feel like they are almost splitting their attention between the baby and the mo- moms, the same as the mom is doing with them, so that they can really find a balance within the home rather than it being feeling lopsided. Hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I mean, on some level, we're we're kind of speaking to gender roles uh, and what they've been before and what they're changing into now is this more equal footing um, mm-hmm. or maybe a, a reverting back to, as you were saying before, there's historical um, yeah. historical evidence that fathers were more engaged. What else do you think people should really understand about this period of time for fathers um, and mood changes? Um, I mean, I know we focus a lot on depression and mood in general, but I think that there's other things, including anxiety disorders, that people don't think about as much during the postpartum period, Mm -hmm. but are definitely relevant. I think that most parents in general just are anxious and have a certain level of worry about what this period is going to look like and not always feeling like they're on top of everything. Mm -hmm. But it becomes problematic, obviously, if it becomes what we call an anxiety disorder, where their level of anticipation of the future starts to get in the way. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen clinically, especially, is that if one parent is anxious, because this person, you trust them, you rely on them, and you know that they're intelligent, when they are overly worried about something, it may even sound reasonable. And the Mm -hmm. concern is that the other partner might start to actually believe these things and start to almost develop their own versions of that anxiety, which almost like they're feeding off of each other Mm -hmm. based on having these fears that will because something could be wrong go, or go, could go wrong, even if it's only a 1% chance, mm-hmm. it starts to create this certain level of over-anticipation, rumination, and anxiety about the future, which can actually be problematic for even the child care and yeah. also for their, their level of engagement. So it's something that I think people don't always look out for, but it's mm-hmm. something that definitely does increase um, for parents during the postpartum period. That's, uh, that's really essential information, too. Um, I mean, I'm assuming on some level when people are kind of in the fog or in the midst of dealing with these higher levels of stress, they're not necessarily noticing that feeding off of each other. Um, So to to point that out and really look for it seems important. Yes, I think that especially for people who may already have a history of irritability or anger, it's only exasperated when the people are sleep deprived. Fatigue definitely has an impact on people's ability to think rationally and also to engage in an appropriate manner. So it becomes more difficult. And if they are feeding off of each other for this anger, it can become problematic and even lead to um, discontent within the, the relationship because mm-hmm. of the level of interactions starting to gear toward the more negative side. So there's something also that couples should look out for because if they do notice it, whether it's couples therapy or just kind of getting some individual support, it would help so that it doesn't cause lasting effect on the, the relationship when actuality might have just been an acute situation that's going on. Mm-hmm. Right. It, it, as opposed to it's just been dragging on for a while to, to really yeah. notice, really notice yeah. what, what the changes are. And that can be hard with a new baby and, and a new uh, life changes. Um, but I think what you're doing by bringing these points to the forefront and, and having us think about it and having people um, notice it is really important because if you're not, we're not putting our finger on it um, to say, "Hey, this could be happening." Then it's just sort of happening um, yeah, exactly. without us paying attention. And I think that many parents are put at disadvantage, feeling they have to wing it. That mm-hmm. they should just kind of do it on their own. That's why I strongly encourage prenatal counseling because it helps you to set up for the future and to be prepared with this information to even learn skills in general, just of how to handle things ahead of time. Yeah. Because I think our tradition and our culture is to just figure it out, maybe read a <laughs> couple of books, but not really right. get that preparation to think about, this is a big change. Like someone yeah. when you start a new job, you want to get oriented. Right. We should not take that same approach when it comes to having a child. Like, why wouldn't we? That's a hundred percent, a thousand percent. You're so right. You're so right. Um, so for people who are listening, what, what have you seen in terms of, um, you know, positive outcomes, people who do come in and get help with stuff? I think that they are, one, we're able to shorten the course of the mood disorder if they are dealing with that. And mm-hmm. that obviously reduces the distress. 
But people are one get, want to get rid of the stress, but that's not what life is really about. It's more about thriving. So when they see that their relationship is improving and that they feel like there's a balance, when they see that their let's say even partner on either side mm-hmm. is meeting them halfway, and that they can see you know for their own value systems, whether it's their career, their recreation, other parts of their life is all included in their life, they feel overall a better quality of life. Rather than just surviving the postpartum period, they feel like mm-hmm. their life has a certain level of meaning and a direction that they can be happy with. And I think that gives people a lot of hope for their future and also makes them enjoy the experience of becoming new parents even more. Oh, man, I wish that for everybody. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, if, if we can, if whoever's listening, um, listen to Dr. Fisher. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> go, go get the help, the support, the resources. And you yourself are going to, are launching a great support for dads. Can you talk about um, your Instagram project? Oh yeah. So right now I have a Instagram focused on just cooking. And what my goal is I do, you know, I love to cook. That's something that's always been one of my passions. And in 2018, I'm hoping to start to um, do cooking classes for fathers and even men in general, one to change the masculine ideas of what, whether men can cook or not, but also to increase confidence so they feel they can balance out the home, they can support the partner, mm-hmm. and to have a skill that is really useful for long term to support you know, family health. So it's something that I'm, I'm excited about, and the handle is Dr. Chef Sheehan um, on Instagram, and I'm, I'm really excited to, to move that project forward in the new year. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I'm for sure going to put um, all of your resources and all the places that people can connect with you up in the show notes for this episode and um, spread the word about the work that you do to anyone who will listen because I think it's brilliant and necessary. Um, oh, and you. I just thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of this with us. And hopefully we'll have you back on again. That sounds good. I would love to come back. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Fisher. We all need to be really having more open conversations about these topics. It is essential. There are so many things to think about and dynamics to consider when entering into parenthood. And for far too long, the focus has been, and for far too long, the focus has only been on baby and mom and left the partner out. Having more conversations like these with the goal of breaking down the stigma and lifting up fathers, supporting them to get the support that they need, That's part of how we have a healthy society. If you'd like to connect with Dr. Fisher, you can find him on Twitter and Facebook at Sheehan D. Fisher and on Instagram at Dr. Chef Sheehan. If this is your first time joining us on the Mom and Mind podcast, please do subscribe so that you get every episode downloaded directly to you as it comes out. And you can listen to us wherever podcasts are played or at momandmind.com. Thank you for being with us. Until next time. Thank you for joining us today. If you or someone you know is having a hard time, help is available. Please look for resources for help at momandmind.com. Also, please subscribe and share this podcast. Together, we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Thank you for being a part of the Mom and Mind community.